Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this session 5BJ of the GSE UK November Conference for 2021. Uh, this session, we've got Ed Jaffe doing a presentation on JS3 Plus IO enhancements. Please post any questions you've got in the chat as we go. And if we've got enough time at the end, we'll get through as many as we can. With that, Ed, the floor is yours, sir. All right, thank you very much, Joe, and thank you all for attending here. Um, I realize I'm the last one of the day, so you're probably all pretty tired from uh, from the day and 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 the entire event, actually. So, uh, but I appreciate you sticking it out and and coming to hear me talk about uh, Jez3 Plus and some of the work we've been doing in terms of I/O enhancements. Now, <clears throat> I want to do a little bit of a, a, a brief history of mainframe I/O evolution because it'd be very difficult for me to tell you what we did unless you understand how it worked before. And then that requires a little bit of background for that. So I'm not gonna go into every little thing that's been done, just sort of high level things, but I wanna sort of make sure that there's a level set on understanding of, of how, what these concepts are. So I'm gonna start with a very simple thing, the disk drive. Now, you know, I, most mainframers understand how to allocate data sets in cylinders and tracks, but, but they may not really understand what are cylinders and tracks. Are they just these arbitrary concepts, uh, arbitrary measurements? What, where did this really come from? And it came from the analog world because the digital world was built on the analog world. You could theoretically build a Z15, a Z15 with like an entire acre or maybe of, of, of vacuum tubes, I don't know, but you know, it'd take a lot of power, but it could, it could be done. And even though these days we have uh, SSD, solid state disc, um, you know, there is still some spinning disc still around. A lot of people are still using that, but it goes back to when our discs began, all of it, it's all being emulated now, but the original disc that we were using had a thing called count key data. But basically a disc looks like this, and it's a platter, a bunch of platters that are stacked on top of each other. And then over here, you have this access arm. And the access arm would go in and position these read-write heads, you know, which were like uh, uh, if you had a reel-to-reel -reel tape recorder or a cassette deck or something like that that could record and play back, that's basically what they are. And this is all magnetic media, right? And the, the arm would position in if it went all the way to the end, uh, most furthest, most point in, that was cylinder zero. And if it backed out a bit, that would be cylinder one, cylinder two, cylinder three, and so forth. So the number of cylinders you had on your, on your disk was dependent upon how much recording surface you had there and also the technology, how closely packed you could put the little tracks. And the tracks are concentric circles on this recording surface on these platters. So this little sort of cartoon diagram over here shows the same thing. You have this read write head assembly, this access arm, and it pushes in and wherever it stops, that's a cylinder. And then whatever tracks are underneath the, the heads there, those are the tracks and all these tracks make a cylinder. Why is it called a cylinder? Look at it, when you stack circles up, that's what you get is a cylinder. So that's why we call it a cylinder. And, and sometimes you'll hear the term head because that referred to which of these recording heads was active to either read or write a record. And other times we just refer to it as tracks, okay? It's really only a head when you're actually reading or writing through a channel program. Otherwise, we just refer to it as tracks because it's just data that's recorded and just sitting out there, all right? So hopefully we all, if you didn't know that before, now you know, this is one of the greatest pieces of, of analog engineering ever is the disk drive. I, I love them and uh, kind of sorry to see them go, to be honest. So now on each track, uh, back in 1964, they, they developed this count key data format, which was a variable length record. These days, most uh, uh, disk technologies use FBA, fixed block architecture, but, but they wanted to have variable length. So they came up with this count key data. And because the track is, is a circle, right? You had to know when, you the control unit had to know how to synchronize. So you had this notion of an index point. And whenever the index point would come back past, that's when it knew that we were getting ready to start you know, again at the top of the track and work our way down. So even though this diagram looks like a line, it's really a circle, right? So you have the index point, then you have a home address and, and a track zero stuff. 
th this is really sort of overhead that's used by the operating system and by the uh, control unit. Um, if you have an opportunity to list this stuff out, it's very interesting what, what um, ZVM does with, uh, with the stuff that goes in here um, uh, for mini disks. But anyway, for normal applications, we only really think about the data records. And so the very first one would be data record one, followed by two and so forth, all up to however many based upon your block size and so forth would fit on this track before you hit the index point again and, and you were back around you know, starting over on that track. And each record was count key data. So you had a count field, a key field, and a data field. These days, you hardly see any keys. That really did not withstand the test of time. And so, uh, you know, the only key data set that I normally see in, in, in my job is a uh, PDS directory. That's the only place that I really see keys anymore. Everything else is just data. So you have a count field and a data field and if you have no key, then this key length in the count field is zero. And if you have a data length of zero, that's your end of file. Okay, so that's how count key data work. And then the, the control unit was connected to the, the, uh, uh, the CPU, they used to call it back then. It wasn't even a Keck or a CPC with these massive gray <laughs> bus and tag cables. I think they came from the factory dirty like this. I, I never saw one clean. I, yeah, I, I think they were all, they, they, they sent them to you gross so that you had a, uh, a, a consistent experience with them. Anyway, um, and it took two of these to make one channel. So they were big, nasty cables and two of them made just one channel and it was all point to point, no switches. Okay, so here's what a channel program looked like back then. You had a, a, a seek and a seek CCW would position the arm, okay? And that would stop on the cylinder you wanted. Then it would turn on the head that you wanted to read or write, okay? And then it would fall through to the next CCW, which was a search. And the search, uh, depending on whether you were searching for a key or a record, the point was, more than likely, when the arm got positioned out there, you were not over the correct record, and you had to wait for the for the uh, um, um, platter to spin around until you were at the correct record, because this was all synchronous back then, right? The CPU was literally reading and writing onto the disk in real time. So the control unit, if you look down here, was really just a gateway. It just helped you select which of the disks on the string you were actually talking to but the data passed straight through it right to the CPU. So when you read, you were reading off spinning disk right into the channel. And when you wrote, you were writing from the channel right to the spinning disk, okay? So this loop was important right here. The search would, if you were in the right position, it would skip over the next CCW. But if you were in the wrong position, it would just fall through to whatever the next CCW was. And traditionally it would be a tick, a transfer in channel, which would go back. So this was a loop. And it would just loop and loop and loop like this while the platter turned until you got to the right spot. Once you're in the right place, then the search would be satisfied. It would skip over the tick and then you would read or write your data. Okay, so that was the very, very first count key data channel programs. Now, in the beginning, you could only have one of these going at a time. The, the, the channel was locked to that disk while it spun around. So after a while, they implemented this thing called RPS or rotational positional sensing. And there's a, there's a uh, call in the CVT, it's still there. It's called CVT Oscar, that's what we used to call it. I think it's zero SCR one or something like that. If you look for that, that's the routine you can call that will give you back the um, uh, sector number that goes with a particular record on, on, on a track. And that sector number is like an angle. So what you, what you would do once RPS came along is there was a set sector C, CCW, which would sit between the seek and the search. And that angle, you would pass that angle in through that CCW. And what would happen then is the, the disk would disconnect, the control unit would disconnect, go back to the CPU and let the CPU do something else. So you could start another read, you could continue another read or write that, that was, you know, while this guy was, was rotating around to the right place. And when finally it hit that angle, then it would generate an interrupt back to the CPU. The CPU would then continue with the search and um, the search would be satisfied right away because you were in the exact right spot and it would just search and read or write. Um, if for some reason it took a long time and you couldn't feel that interrupt quickly enough, things were very busy, 
then when the search started going, it would be too late. You'd already gone past the record and that's what they used to call an RPS miss. You'd have to go around again to, uh, to satisfy the search, okay? Now, what's interesting about that is if you look in channel programs today, you do a GTF trace of them, whether it's you know, ECKD or uh, even uh, ZHPF channel programs, you will still see these RPS sector values in there. And if you look in the, in the books, the ZOS manuals that talk about XDAP and EXEP and so forth, they describe how you call that CVT Oscar and everything. So it's kind of funny because it has zero meaning in today's world, none at all. And yet <laughs> there are these RPS uh, values still being passed in channel program. Okay, so in 81, we went to en enhanced count key data, ECKD. That's when XA came out. Um, obviously, that was a, a big feat of engineering to go from 24-bit to 31-bit. Uh, the ZOS folks moved the nucleus so that it straddled the line. There was a lot of things that were done with that, but really, in the end, all they did was fundamentally added seven bits to the addressing. The bigger change, the more revolutionary change is what they did to I.O. They got rid of the channels. They got a, ch uh, a channel subsystem. Then you had sub-channels, channel paths, dynamic pathing, storage control unit caching, and things like this. So this was really the bigger change with XA, and it decoupled the device and the control unit trans transfer from that of the channel and the control unit. So you no longer were doing this stuff synchronously. You're no longer reading and writing in real time, okay? That was called non-synchronous operation, and among other things, allowed us to have much longer channel cables because you didn't need that, that close timing. So we were still using bus and tag back then. They had switched to these um, blue cables, which were uh, much thinner and easier to pull. I think they still came from the factory gross and dirty, but uh, you know they, they were still there. And it was all parallel technology. If you notice, you see these have a lot of, a lot of um, uh, wires in them. When we went to SCON in, uh, with System 390 in 1990, that's when... Um, we uh, uh, switched from parallel to, to uh, serial cables. They were optical, they were half duplex, and it really made a big difference. The speed jumped from 4.5 meg to 10 meg per second and later 17. You could share devices now between mainframes. The max distance on these things was 26 miles um, and they were hot pluggable. So prior to that, you know, if you wanted to uh, unplug a, a bus and tag cable, you need to take your machine down. So this was a, a pretty big, very cool change. So the way those channel programs look, no more loop, right? Because you're not doing it synchronously. So instead you have a defined extent to set some boundaries. You have locate record to tell it where you wanna go. That's CCHHR, that cylinder head and record, right? These are still uh, analog sled devices. And then you would read or write the record that you wanted to read and write. One of the great things about SCON is it then allowed switching. So you could put a switch in there so you didn't have to be point to point. So you could have a lot more devices being uh, addressed than, than you could. And actually, I think in XA, that's when they came out with uh, the uh, 64K device limit at that point, prior to when they had multiple sub-channel sets like we have today. But anyway, that's digressing. Both IBM JES2 and JES3 use uh, these ECKD channel programs. So does RACF and many, many other ZOS components. It's the most popular um, uh, uh, you know, CCW uh, channel program that you're going to see with any product that uses, um, you know, EXCP, writes its own channel programs and doesn't use an access method like BSAM or QSAM or something like that. Now, even, you know, the CCWs and commands and responses, they're still being sent across the channel, but at least we weren't synchronous with the disk anymore. And that made a huge difference. Then in 1998 came along what we like to call advanced count key data. And that is when we switched from sled devices, single large expensive disks to RAID, right? A redundant array of independent disks. And we started emulating CKD. And that was a big change. I think it really started with the STK iceberg, but whatever. We actually had a multi-price 3000 in our shop for a while. And the internal disk storage on that. Um, supported this ACKD, as did IBM Shark DASD, which came in 2001. We had one of those as well. And so it was all being cached. Um, it, basically, no matter what operation you did, it would read an entire track into cache, then perform the operation on that, on that track. And then if it was a write, put it back onto the RAID array. 
it was not, uh, you were not dealing with the individual CKD records as your channel program thought you were. It's all being emulated. So there were a bunch of new commands and CCWs. And I, you know, I did a version of this, a shorter version of this presentation for uh, IBM Expert TV last month. And when I came to this point, I erroneously uh, implied that you couldn't jump from cylinder to cylinder in a single channel program. Uh, that wasn't true. That's not what I meant to say. What I was talking about, one of the new CCWs, uh, the way they changed things prior to this, uh, when you, if you were doing multi-track reads in a cylinder, when you reached the end, you got an end of cylinder exception. You could not, through a read, cause the arm to move. You had to explicitly move the arm with like a locate record or something. And after this came along, they came up with new concepts that allowed you to ignore the cylinder boundaries and you could have multi-track reads that would read past the end of a cylinder and just keep going. So for any bit twiddlers out there that heard me say that and thought, Ed, that's not quite right. I, that's not what I meant to say. <laughs> anyway, um, so, um, and then they also came out with this MIDAW. Now prior to MIDAWs, there were IDAWs and IDAWs were a more restrictive kind of a thing, indirect address words, so that instead of your CCW pointing at the, at the storage, you could point to an IDAW, which then pointed to the storage. But they were you know, either fixed on a 2K or 4K um, fixed uh, real memory boundary. MIDAWs were much better because you could now have a, a lot of little pieces that you could assemble to make one record or split them apart when you read records. My DAWs were modified in direct IDAWs and, and it really made a big difference. At the same time, we came out with FICOM, which was optical full duplex serial. So it was like SCOM, but way, way faster. And if you look at the current ones, FICOM Express 16, you're moving two gigabytes a second of, of data instead of, if you look back in the day, right? 4.5 meg on the, on the bus and tag. And the way that uh, channel programs look here, they shortened it down even more. So you have a single CCW called prefix, which does all the work of define extent and locate record. Then you did your read or write. So it was just that simple. So the prefix command did, pardon me, slightly reduce the uh, protocol overhead, but the real advantages, and this is what we're gonna take advantage of and I'll show you later, is when you do read and write track data commands coupled with MIDAWs so that you can minimize the number of C, uh, CCWs you use to process an entire track of data, okay? And then there were less obvious enhancements as well, track sets and things, and that gets into that stuff I was talking about where they blur uh, out the, the need to understand the end of cylinder and things like that, and you can have track sets that, that span all that kind of stuff. And again, you have switches just like you did in the, in the uh, SCON days, okay? And then now, believe it or not, this has been 13 years since uh, HPF came out, high performance FICON. It was a totally new channel programming technique that they called transport mode. So if you look in the principles of operation, you see that they took the old stuff that they used to just call channel programming and they moved it into a chapter they called command mode, or maybe it's a sub chapter. And then they have this other mode called transport mode. And the DS8100s were the first to get this ZHPF uh, code via a co code bundle upgrade. And then, and then the Z10 uh, emulated this over ordinary FICON. We had both of these. We had a DS8100 and, and a Z10. So we were able to start using uh, ZHPF right away, um, but it was being emulated. It didn't have all the features. It, it wasn't as fast actually as, as or, or couldn't support as much data in a single, in a single uh, uh, transfer as you could once they hit the, the uh, Enterprise 196 and 114s in 2010, because that's when the channels did transport mode natively. And that's when things really started to speed up. Transport mode implements all new 64-bit channel programs. Those are some of the control blocks right there. Those are the major ones. And, and, and what makes it fast, why it's high performance, is that unlike command mode, where the CCWs are going back and forth across the, uh, across the, the, uh, the channel, uh, what you do with, with this is you take uh, the actual channel program itself and send the whole thing down to the control unit. And then the control unit works on that down there without having to interact with the host anymore. And then it just sends the results back um, you know, over the channel. So that really is uh, part of what makes it so much faster than the traditional FICON. I'll show you a chart on that in a minute. 
here's what it looks like. The CCWs are gone. The, the whole structure of the thing is different. It, it no longer is sort of a program you can follow, but instead it's just a big sort of parameter list. And you have this thing called a TCW, the, the control word, which the channel itself uses to point to all these different things. The TCCB is what gets sent down to the uh, control unit to be worked on. Um, the data is no longer inter interlaced with the, you know, it used to be CCWs would point to the data and they'd also be sent down to the control unit. That no longer happens. Now all the um, data is pointed to by a, a TIDAW list, which is a TIDAW is just a new version of a MIDAW. It's double wide, it's 64 bit, and, and it, it has some other nice features. You can tick from a TIDAW to a TIDAW and things like that. But anyway, um, things you couldn't do with MIDAWs. All the data is pointed to here. And then once the IO is done, then, then the results are passed back in this TSB. So the channel is actually doing this work. It's a much, much more uh, uh, smarter set of, of, uh, of code. You don't have to do as much work as the programmer, but it's much harder to understand in a way because it, it and, and by the way, it, in part, because it's not very well documented. Somebody at IBM, uh, some genius decided this should all be intellectual property. And we, we don't wanna let people know how to make code run faster how to make IO run faster on the mainframe. We're gonna hide that and, and try to charge people money for it. But at the same time, the left hand doesn't know what the right hand's doing. And they, and they uh, of course, uh, contributed ZHPF code into the field with Linux. So if you really wanna see programs using ZHPF, uh, it's hard to find them on, on ZOS, but it's very easy to find in uh, Linux for Z. So if you know how to do that, then, and you're interested in this, that's, that's a good place to go look and learn and see how it's being done. So um, now the performance on this is really the key to it and why it's so important. If you look here at the last three generations of channel technology, the, the uh, FICON Express 8, 16, and 16S Plus, you see that the FICON side of it, you know, your regular CCWs, command mode and everything, that's basically stabilized. There's no improvements going on really at all in that space. It, you know, they get tiny improvements, but that's, you know, it's just uh, by, by happenstance. All the, all the effort is being put into uh, ZHPF and you can see right now, uh, the IO per second right here, we're up to, um, uh, we're up to 13 X on that. And, and over here, five X on the actual uh, throughput rate. So uh, it's definitely, uh, the the, the uh, uh, technology that you want to be using if you're doing uh, channel programming. All right, so with that uh, little uh, introduction, I'm now going to talk a little bit about what JES3 was doing before we made changes to it, okay, so that you understand what our changes were. So the original uh, JES3 spool I.O. control blocks are here. There's an IOP, which is like a master control block, and then you have EXTs or extents. So each of these represents a spool extent. And then there is a whole pool of these ISRs. Now you have to understand that JES3 does start IO, which is a more um, sophisticated, lower level type of IO than even EXCP is and or EXCP VR. So, and if you do that, when you do start IO, you have um, an IOSB control block that you're using and an SRB. And so um, th that pair, IOSB SRB pair is what's inside the ISR. Then over here, you have DMCs and DATs. The DMC represents an IO request for a single block to be read or written to or from spool. And then a DAT is the, the actual buffer, 2K or 4K or whatever size buffer um, you have that's gonna be read or written to or from spool, okay? And the original access method, again, everything was ECKD. And of course, CKD is supported, but there are no devices like that anymore. You'd have to almost fake it in the code to see it actually work. It's still supported by modern disks if you do CKD. So you could try it, but they're very, very, very slow. Anyway, um, each request, as I said, represented by a DMC. The multiple DMCs were sorted by CCHHR and, and, and then they were chained together in one long channel program and then they were launched with the start IO macro. Now, the reason they sorted it this way was to minimize head movement, arm movement, because that was the slowest part. The disk could run, uh, spin very, very fast and they got faster and faster and faster. It's very hard to move the arm and stop it. That was the slowest part of the whole thing. So by sorting it this way, 
they would uh, have all the, all the things that had to go in one cylinder together. And so the arm would move out. They would do all the IOs in that position, then move the arm to a new position, do all the read writes that needed to happen there, move the arm to another position, do all the read writes that happened there, uh, that were needed there and so forth. Okay, so that's why they did that. And it really made a big difference back in the sled device days, huge difference. And, and these guys were so smart that they figured out how to actually overlap the IO from the MVS perspective. So before the IO would even formally complete, they would launch the next one out because they used a thing called an IOS die routine. I'd never even seen one of these things before I, uh, before I started looking at, at uh, Jez3 stuff. And um, they would get driven right at the time the interrupt was happening. And if the IO looked like it was fine, they would go ahead and launch the next IO right from there, um, even before the completion SRB ran in some cases. So it was, it was overlapping, very cool. It was called a, like a seldom ending channel program and they did end seldom. So here's what they would do. In this case, I'm gonna use this example over and over. So I'm gonna go through it. There would be five DMCs here. By the way, this is a three chili pitch. Uh, maybe it's supposed to be a four chili pitch. I don't know, but they only go to three. So just <laughs> keep that in mind. I'll try to make it as simple as possible. Anyway, so the first TMC uh, here has a defined extent, a locate record like we talked about. This is ECKD. And then it would have a read. But there's five, uh, there were five on the wake queue. So they were chaining them all together and launching this single IO. So um, they would a tick from here to this guy from one read to the next. It's like having two reads in a row, but you sort of have a go-to in between it. And the reason that they went from one read right to the next is because these two guys are on the same, they're actually next to each other. So th these two DMCs are, are represent records that are right next to each other on the track. All three of these DMCs are on the same track, okay? But this one is a little bit distant. So there's a few records in between. So maybe this would be the first two records on the track, There'd be and then a couple of records in between, <clears throat> pardon me. And then this guy right here on the track would be um, uh, discontiguous. And so when they did a tick to him, instead of ticking straight to the read, they had to tick to the locate record because that was how they could skip over those records that were in between, okay? Now these two here are totally discontiguous. They're not part of this track. There's a write in here and there's a read and then that would be the end end of the channel program. And this would be what they'd launch. So there's basically five requests here that represent, I don't know how many CCWs are on here. There's quite a few. And the way it would work is the IO requester, whatever it was, let's say this channel program was not running, then um, whoever it was uh, would realize that the extent was not busy. The, there was no IO running. So they would uh, sort and link up the DMCs and go ahead and launch this IO. Okay, that could happen from anywhere your batch job that is writing to spool or, or, or some uh, uh, you know, spool browse product that's, that's looking at a report or something like that. Now, if the extent's busy, meaning that there is an IO in progress, then all they would do is add that new request to the wait queue and wait, somebody else would, would launch it when that, when that channel program ended, okay? So, and that, that would most of the time happen in this die routine. So again, iOS, he fields interrupts in any, address space, wherever it just happens to be. And he would drive this die routine for these guys. And um, they would, uh, because it was a die, they had to authorize iOS retry if there were temporary IO errors. But that's not really why they were there. They were, they were there because they wanted to try to get their next IO launched. So they would schedule a completion SRB back to the JES3 address space. And then if there were no IO errors and there was something on the way queue, they would go ahead and launch that next IO, even before the completion SRB was running potentially. So it was very cool. They were doing this overlap. These guys uh, really figured out some cool stuff. Now, then the completion SRB itself, when it finally hit the JES3 address space, it would run with the local lock held. It would loop through all the DMCs, in this case, five. And it would uh, post all the requesters buffers. It would release the PBUFs. Uh, because you have to understand, unless you're doing internal IO uh, for JES's own IO, normal end user, uh, they, their buffers are called UBUS, unprotected buffers. And then JES, both JES 2 and 3 have this concept of PBUFs, protected buffers. So the PBUFs is where the actual IO takes place. And so if you're doing a write, you're copying data from the UBUF to the PBUF. 
And if you're doing a read, when the read is done, you're copying data back from the PBUF to the UBUF, okay? So if you've ever heard these terms thrown around with respect to JES, that's what it is, okay? And then again, in the completion SRB, if it was a non-empty weight queue, they would do this again, link up all the uh, uh, DMCs that are out there and launch it again. If it was empty, that would finally end that seldom ending channel program and it would just idle. Nothing was happening until another IO request came through, okay? So that's how they had done it. Um, not trying to make this very complicated. Hopefully it's easy. I just want you to understand what they were doing so that you can see what, how we improved what they were doing, okay? So the first change we made was ACKD, Advanced Count Key Data. That was the first uh, new IO access method we added. So uh, we used the prefix command, we used the read and write track data commands, and we used MIDOS, all that new stuff. We acquired a MIDOS pool <clears throat> in a, a page fixed um, ECSA during initialization or if you make a change through a command. And, uh, and it's managed using the PLO instruction. If you're not familiar with that, performed lock oper locked operation. It's kind of like compare and swap, but it, it lets you do uh, more things at once. It's, a, it's like juggling more balls in the air. Uh, it's a pretty cool instruction. And, and if you read about the principles of operation, your eyes might bleed, but it is, is very, very useful. Anyway, um, so where we get a big part of the performance, yes, the use of prefix makes it a little faster because there's a little bit less transfer. But by uh, we, what we do is DMCs that represent requests on the same track, we combine them into a single CCW and use MIDOS. That's where the performance comes from, okay? Now, because MIDOS support can actually be disabled, it's not built into the machine. There's an operator command to shut it off. Then you could actually get an in-flight uh, IO that fails if you're using MIDOS and they happen to get shut off. So we have to account for that. And we intercept those failing uh, channel programs in our completion SRB. We convert them to ECKD and we relaunch them so that the bulk of the JES3 code never ever sees this, right? We didn't have to change anything there. All we did was this like little subtle intercept right there. And we wrote a conversion routine to convert ACKD, ACKD back to ECKD and then we relaunch it. And then if we get an ECKD that has an IO error, then obviously that's a legit one. We've, you know, we've retried it, but it's still failing. Um, for it, so it's failing for another reason, not because the set iOS MIDOS got disabled or something like that. So then those get passed through uh, as normal to the IO error DSP. So uh, the, the spool control box, the big change we made here was really just to add the MIDOS pool. And here's that optimization. So here's that same five um, uh, DMCs, but in this case, now there was a defined extent locate record here in ECKD. The prefix command, it turns out, is quite long, much too long to fit in the DMC, and we didn't want to make the DMCs bigger. So we uh, put the prefix command in the extent because there's way fewer extents than there are DMCs, right? Um, and that's not a problem because there's only one IO per extent. So um, at a time. So we, the prefix is in the extent, and then we tick from that to a read track data. And that basically handles all the guys that are on a single track. So um, uh, DMC one, two, and three, they're all being picked up with that single read track data. We have a MIDAW list here, and there are actually four MIDAWs in here, one, two, and three, those actually copy data into uh, discontiguous disk buffers. And then this MS is a skip MIDA that basically handles the fact that there are records in between um, these two uh, discontiguous. They're on the same track, remember, but they're discontiguous. So uh, on that track, so the, the skip MIDA handles that, okay? And what's cool about that is now we can tick, not to any of this, but we can tick completely around all the CCWs that are involved in that, in that one read track data and then continue on with these two just the way they were, this discontiguous write and discontiguous read. So, um, and sometimes you can have a whole track being read. So you're converting, well, in the case of JCTs, instead of reading 41 uh, of them in and at a time with 41 CCWs, you do it in one. So it gets a lot faster like at startup to read all the JCTs into memory. And then even uh, there's a lot of cases where <clears throat> if you're writing 
if you're writing report data out of a out of a uh, batch job, there's a very very good chance that most of your records are all going to be on the same track. And if you're reading that back in through a spool browser or something like that, you want to be able to optimize that. So this does make a pretty big uh, difference in terms of performance. All right. So the next one is ZHPF, the second new I/O access method that we added. This uses again transport mode channel programs. And what we did here was we acquired a, a one meg T cell pool. Um, in 64-bit common, it's page fixed and backed by a one meg frame. And because it's backed by a one meg frame, that means you need to have LF area. That's a new requirement. <clears throat> There's no, uh, prior to that, there was no requirement that IBM JES3 have LF area available to it. And actually there's no requirement that does JES3 Plus have LF area available to it unless you wanna use um, uh, ZHPF. Okay, and uh, so, and again, this, this support can be enabled or disabled dynamically by an operator. So we had to intercept failures and, and convert it back to ECKD the same way we did with ACKD, all right? So the spool control block update here really was just to add this 64-bit T cell. And again, LF area is required. Now here's the structure of that, once again, uh, ZHPF channel programs don't look anything like the other ones. They're not really easy to follow in that sense. So it's really just a bunch of pointers pointing to different things. And so we're trying to show you here what that is. Everything that's got the green outline is in 64-bit T self. So it's nice. It, it, it doesn't chew up, you know, CSA, uh, you know, normal CSA and stuff like that. Now, one thing I should point out is the original ZHPF implementation only allowed either all reads or all writes in a channel program. And then later on in a later release of, of uh, the hardware, they came out with this FCX uh, bi-directional data transfer uh, facility. And uh, we're not actually using that right now. So we're still using the original rule set. We may look at that at some point, uh, but it hasn't impacted um, our performance, we don't think. So uh, it's not a very high priority, but we might, we might look into that. Anyway, so the, uh, the, the channel program optimization that's done here with the ZHPF um, is here, you know, there's no ticking and chaining and stuff like that, but these are the same five DMCs here. Um, but in the TCCB, the TCAH, the TCA header has in it basically the same data that would have been in a prefix in ACKD. And then you have these DCWs and the first one we use, of course, is the read track data. And we're doing, once again, the very same optimization we were doing in the ACKD, only we're doing it again. We're using a read track data to pick up these three. We're using TIDOS. So we have a TIDOS one, two, and three actually move the data into these buffers. And then there's a skip TIDOS, which works just like the skip MIDOS to skip you know, these records in between right here. Now, the thing about ZHPF is it also all of the data is pointed to by the TIDAWs in this list. So we also have to put T5 in there. Now, that's a little tricky, uh, definitely not documented anywhere, but uh, it's, it's how you um, can do multiple discontiguous reads and writes. We actually do, uh, this, this is being handled through a discontiguous, uh, there's a way that you can add extensions to a DCW and you have to update your lengths appropriately and things like that. And it allows you to support discontiguous CCHHRs in a single uh, ZHPF channel program. So we're taking advantage of that so that we can do the same kind of IO we were doing before and not have to do you know, one IO at a time for every buffer or anything like that. Now, note you probably noticed the DMC4 is missing. That's because we can only do reads or writes in one channel program. We sort of alternate the two. So uh, we de-chain DMC4 and put it back on the wait queue. We'll pick it up next time when we're doing all the, all the writes, okay? So this, this channel program is reads only. And for, for anybody that says, well, wait a minute, that means you're doing twice as many IOs as you did before. Maybe so, but the start IO rate on this thing is 13X. So I don't think, <laughs> I'm not too worried about that. We're doing just fine. All right, so now the customer controls here, access method is a new keyword uh, on the option statement. And you can specify either ECKD, ACKD, or ZHPF. And if you don't specify anything, you get the same original ECKD. And it really is like a chicken switch. If you specify ECKD, 
it's running like 95% of all the original, um, oops, didn't mean to do that, all the original um, uh, uh, IBM JES3 access method code, right? Hardly any of our code is really in there if you, if you do that. If you uh, choose the other ones, then you know, obviously you're, you're going through a lot more code that, that we wrote um, and, and getting uh, performance benefits from it. So uh, you can pick this value up, uh, changes to it through a modify config command or any of the kinds of restarts that will read the init deck and, and make things happen, including a cold start. I don't recommend that <laughs> unless, unless it's a brand new, brand new JESplex. Anyway, but it provides you with you know, ultimate flexibility. We made some updates to some of the commands. There's an uh, inquiry options command that comes out. And here you could see it's showing that we're running with ZHPF right here. There's an inquiry queue command that's used to list you know, spool partitions and spool volumes and things like that. And here you can see it's saying again, ZHPF is being used, okay? There's some diagnostics changes that we made um, for anybody that's, you know, likes to look at this kind of stuff, either in IPCS or there's a thing called the dump core DC DSP in, in JES3 plus and JES3. And so this thing called option equals JIO shows you the, um, uh, uh, a lot, everything having to do with the IO. And we've added some ACKD statistics to that if you're using ACKD using uh, ZHPF, then we added some stats there. And then on the actual extent itself, we added some additional um, uh, uh, words here. DFR IO, deferred IO, that's the number of times that we, for example, took that DMC4 right and put it back on the way queue versus uh, just running it in line so that we could see uh, what percentage that is of, of uh, you know, the actual number of IOs we're doing. Um, the, the CP fix, that's the number of times we fixed an IO, if you will, not, not page fixed, but uh, converted back to, to ECKD. Hopefully we don't do that ever. We want that to be zero if possible. And then this last one over here is just how big the, the TCCB got. As far as performance observations on this stuff, uh, we and others have seen about approximately two thirds reduction in JES3 plus global restart elapsed time using e ACKD and an about a four fifths reduction using ZHPF and uh, block spooler exploiter, exploiters, you know, seeing uh, if we run them in a loop, you see sustained 25% of lapse time reductions. That's with, you know, either one really. And those exploiters include JCL stream input handling, writers and printers, TCP NJE servers, spool browse products, et cetera. So uh, there's a lot of uh, uh, functions that, that would be, uh, either directly or indirectly using this block spooler. And they're gonna pick up the enhancements with um, uh, particularly reading, but also writing multiple um, records per, per track, okay? And then of course, ZHPF has these start IO rates and data transfer rates that are you know, approximately 13 and 5X respectively. So you get all that, what we did for ACKD and the com combining things on the same track, plus all this other stuff, okay? And the other stuff is, you know, less workload specific. You don't need multiple things on the same track. And so you're just gonna pick up overall uh, performance gains um, using ZHPF. Okay, and then the last one here I'm gonna talk about is parallel IO support. This is something that's actually not in the field yet other than being tested, but so far it's really uh, uh, performing very, very well. Um, it enhances performance by launching more than one IO at a time per extent. Remember that when they invented all this, there was no such thing as parallel access volumes. So if you had a second IO to an existing volume, iOS would just queue it. Uh, and so parallel access volumes ended all that so that you could start many IOs to the same, to the same device. And as long as they didn't, you know, the extents didn't exactly overlap, then you know, they could run simultaneously, literally on the same volume. Remember, it's all being emulated. So it's not really spinning. There's no arm on the cylinder and all that. So you can easily update this thing uh, from multiple places because the whole thing's being uh, emulated by rate arrays, okay? Now, what the, the change here is that when we would have ordinarily put a new request, we see that it's busy, there's, you know, the, the IO is busy. We would have normally put a new request onto the wake queue. Now we look for an available parallel path to launch it. And if we find one, we launch it down that path in parallel with the IO that's already going. 
Okay, and if there's no paths available, the request is queued just like before. And the customer external for this is a new max pav keyword and defaults to one uh, and supports values up to eight. I will say this is not a chicken switch. We had to drastically change uh, the structure of things to make this work. So coding max pav one does not go back to the original IBM code. <laughs> it's, it just doesn't. So if you really want to go back to the original IBM code, you would need to back off this, this uh, PTF or APAR <laughs> because this is a change. So keep that in mind. Anyway, and again, it can be changed uh, through modify config or through a restart. So here's how you would find the extent um, uh, normally, uh, you know, in the past and now. Nothing's changed here, but I'm just setting this up so you can see it. Um, you take your spool addresses in JES3 are represented by a six byte um, value, a, a two byte extent number, which they call M and, a, and a, six, a, a four byte record number, which they call R. You'll see in books and, and other places, M.R, that's what it replies, uh, um, uh, is referencing. And you, you basically take your extent number and then you index into this table here. And that table has pointers to the EXT control blocks for whatever that extent happens to be, okay? And, and that's unchanged. We haven't changed a thing about that, but I just want you to know that's how you get to the EXT. Now, when you're at the EXT, it used to be just one IO per. So what we've done is parallelize the EXT control block. Now, the Brits, you guys probably put an S there. I don't know, parallelizing with an S. I, I wasn't sure. <laughs> so I just spell it the good old fashioned American way. What could I say? Uh, so, uh, you know, bear with me. Anyway, so um, uh, so what we did was we parallelized this. So extent number one now, now points into an index of itself. And there's a thing here that tells us how what the max pav is set to. So with max pav two, it's pointing to two index entries, which point to two of these, what we call EXPs. And the EXPs hold the fields that were originally in the EXT that were required to run a single IO. Okay, so you can see we've, we've re-engineered this uh, a fair amount to make this work. So, so the stuff that used to be in the EXT that ran a single IO is now in the EXP. So for example, if you're running ACKD, that prefix command, uh, the CCW, it's sitting in an EXP now instead of in the EXT, okay? So this would be how it would be at, at startup if you did that and you specified max pav equals two. These are uh, contiguous blocks of storage here, okay? Now, we also save the index size in the IOP here for, uh, so that we can remember what it was for growth. So if we wanna go ahead and shrink from max pav two back down to max pav one, all we do is just stop, we just start ignoring these guys. We don't move any control blocks around or change anything. All we do is we just change the pav number here to one. And by attrition, all the in-flight IOs eventually stop referencing them. Uh, it could be, you know, products out there that are referencing now. I could be anybody. It could be Tone Software's OMC Flash. It could be uh, SysView from Broadcom or MainView from from uh, 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 BMC or you know uh, VPS. Anybody that's that might be interested in this data could be in these control blocks. And so you, you know we don't want to reallocate them. You have to leave them out there just in the state they're in. And so that those programs won't, won't ab in. But the main reason is so that in-flight IOs won't ab in. That's really important. And we want to make sure that, that any IO that's running keeps going. So now if we were to grow to max path three, in this case, we acquire a brand new index, totally new. And the old one is just orphaned. Okay. And this is a small thing. It's not like it's a lot of memory, but it's orphaned so that all those products, you know, like the ones I mentioned and many more. Uh, don't run into problems. They're still pointing at the original EXPs they were pointing to. Nothing's moved. But now that we have three, we now acquired a new chunk of storage to hold the EXP threes. And by the time, and we update everything in just the right order so that uh, there's, you know, nothing goes wrong. And so these PAV numbers are three here in the extent, and we keeping track of the fact that the index size is three. So if you shrunk back down to two, all you would be doing is again, shrinking, uh, just ignoring index three. And if you shrunk down to one, you'd just be ignoring indexes two and three. But uh, we can get back to any combination of what we had before, you know, going back and forth, and we've tested all those paths. So anyway, um, 
you know, that's basically how the, the PAF stuff works and it's all parallel. And, and uh, the performance we're seeing on it right now is really pretty amazing. We had somebody tell us just the other day that they saw a 70% reduction on top of what they had with ZHPF. So let me just say that we're pretty excited about this. On the horizon, we have a JES3 Plus uh, Customer Advisory Council. It's an invitation only group of customers that we trust uh, to help us uh, you know, make good decisions about what we should or should not be working on uh, to make sure we don't you know, run down some rabbit hole because it's the flavor of the month and, and instead concentrate on things that, that make sense for their actual business priorities, okay? But one of the top ranked ideas, because we explained to them the, the value of this, is to, to allow us to uh, mitigate the local lock contention problem that we have right now to allow more IOs to complete. Because at the moment, all those completion uh, SRBs are running with the local lock held. They're running in one address space, the JES3 plus address space. So even if we were to launch 1,000 IOs, we're still single threading the completions through uh, a, on a single CP and a single address space. It's, it's, not, it's not a great design, to be honest, as far as that goes. And so we think we can do a, a two big things here. We can run the completion SRB unlocked. That would be huge. That would allow you know, multiple completion SRBs to all be running concurrently. And then we'd only acquire the local lock as needed. For example, to page fix or page unfix something uh, that those services require the local lock be held. And we think part of the reason they were holding the local lock was, was uh, so that they had access to the local lock save area because when this stuff was all written, uh, storage was at a premium and uh, uh, there wasn't a lot of places for them to put to, put, uh, to save registers and use things as work areas. So by not holding the local lock, we don't have that, that save area available to us anymore. So we're gonna, I don't know what we're gonna do. I think we're gonna create a, a DMC extension in 64-bit and, and use that. But anyway, that's still being designed. And then uh, the other thing we're gonna do is direct the completion SRBs themselves. If they're for non-JSAM IO, meaning ordinary end user IO, reports coming out of batch, uh, you know, spool browse products, whatever it is, that we're going to um, direct the completion SRBs to address spaces other than the JES3 Plus address space. So they'll be running more than likely in the address space of the, of the requester. And then that way we're spreading that pain out. Um, and, you know, the local lock problem essentially goes away there too, um, because you're only get, you're getting the local lock, but you're getting it for a different address space. Okay. So anyhow, <laughs> we're excited about all of these things. And when it's all finished, we, uh, we really do expect JES3 Plus will be the fastest JES on planet Earth. And we'll be pretty darn proud of that when we reach that. And, and we're going to do some benchmarks to see if it's, see if it's true. So uh, stay tuned and, uh, and we will uh, keep you up to date. We'll probably be back next year at GSC to talk about all the great stuff we did and, and, and hopefully our results and have some pretty nice benchmarks to show. Anyway, with that, um, I think that should be the end. Yeah, they're talking about the charity raffle at this point. So, so obviously it's time for questions if there are any. Any questions for Ed? It's nothing in the chat. Um, definitely four chilies. Um, we can, I can tolerate your, your use of US uh, English, right? Definitely an S in our world rather than a Z or Z, I should say. <laughs> yeah, That's I good. see something. <laughs> good, good. Coming there from question. Mike. <laughs> yeah. 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 Right. Well, you know, I mean, uh, it, you know, I could stand up here and do a dog and pony show and just show, but hopefully, you know, look, you know, you can take these slides, they'll be available. And if you're interested in it, you can study it. If you're not interested in it, well, at least you have an idea that, let me put it this way um, it's clear that we have not uh, acquired JES3 for the purposes of turning it into a cash cow. Right. This is not what we're doing. We're not just going to maintain it by, you know, fixing bugs or making sure it keeps running. Right. Our goal is to actually uh, extend and improve the JES3 technology through our derivative work known as JES3 Plus. And I think that this demonstrates beyond a shadow of a doubt that we have the capability to do exactly that. And that's what we're doing. That's our goal. And, and we are making really good progress in, in, in that endeavor. Well, look, really interesting session. That brings the large system stream for this year's conference to a close. So um, hopefully we'll see you next year at some of the large working group sessions we'll be running 
kind of on a bi-monthly basis, maybe a bit more frequent than that, not sure yet, but definitely at the conference next year. So um, Ed, thanks, amazing. It's a great history lesson for me. I think the first 50% of that I was before I was born. Most of that was uh, happening and being involved and whatnot. So yeah, brilliant for me. So um, yeah, thanks. I'll shut it down there, guys. Have a great evening, afternoon, wherever you are. Much appreciated and hopefully see you again soon. All right. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. Thanks all. Cheers.